Well, there's nothing, there's no really waste on a pig, and I think that's what makes it good for us, but also good for um, the farmers as well. There's a lot, there's a lot we can do with pig, and there's nothing that really goes to waste. And we're getting much better at, at, at that as well, and, and developing more products on our farmers' market list that we can try and make sure that we, you know, absolutely minimise all the waste we've got. This is the crackling. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Key moments in life often drive significant change. For Jim Casey, the moment to start a family had him yearning to move back to the region he grew up in, and it triggered a shift in his career from chef to one of Australia's best charcutiers. Jim, you've had Little Acre Foods for about eight years now. What triggered the jump into charcuterie and small goods? Um, well, to be honest, we were uh, living in Western Australia at the time, uh, and then uh, we got... Um, I'm from South Australia originally. My wife's Western Australian, and we decided that we'd get married back in um, South Australia. And uh, when we did that, we um, sort of made the decision at the time that that was um, an opportunity to maybe move back to South Australia. Um, South Australia had always been where I'd sort of had my own passion for food and really ignited every time I came back, especially to the Fur Peninsula and around McLaren Vale and um, you know, the uh, passion I felt for food um, reignited when every time I came back to South Australia. Um, and so when we decided that we would move back, one of the sort of ideas was that I was going to do that. We weren't, I wasn't going to just get another job as a, as a chef uh, working in a restaurant or anything. I was going to try and do something for myself. Um, so yeah, came up with a few different options and I guess at the time we needed something that was going to be fairly, um, uh, low risk at the time. We didn't know whether we were going to stay, whether how that was going to work after spending so long in Western Australia, you know, we sort of just packed up and left basically and come come back over um, and we yeah, needed something that was low in low investment and thought um, it always had a bit of a um, love affair with the Wollonga farmers market um, and felt that I could you know if we could make a, a product to be able to sell there that um, you know that would be a, a you know, small start in the business um, and it just happened to be that when we sort of moved back at that time was also around about the time that the um, small bar license was really opening up in South Australia um, I think one of the first places to get that small bar license was a place called Canteen Social, which at the time was owned by uh, Justin Lane and Angie Bignall and Georgie Rogers, who um, have gone off to do other things in the area as well. Um, and after a sort of choice encounter one night there, drinking a few too many glasses of red, I suggested that maybe they had some pate on their menu and it was missing one thing. Um, and sure enough, basically, they turned around and said, well, you know, if you know someone that makes it, we can... Um, you know, we'll put it on, and, and that was that. Basically, we um, I went away the next day and found some found some product, and just needed to um, find a kitchen to make it, and then the story sort of evolved from there, really. Well, I want to dive into that whole world and what you've created uh, with Little Acre Foods shortly. But you mentioned your chefing. Take us back to when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play for you and your family? Um. Yeah, it's an interesting one, that one. Food was always, a, you know, obviously always around. It wasn't a major, I don't have a major sort of family food background. I don't, you know, don't have memories of Nana making lots of food and those sort of memories that um, lots of other people in the industry probably do. But, um, yeah, we used to, um, you know, we'd eat out a fair bit and my parents were always ex- you know, quite encouraging with, um, ex- you know, eating different types of food and, and serving us interesting food. Um, Mum was always really good at just making do with whatever we had. Um, whatever was fresh in the garden. My mum's a great cook and so is my dad as well. Um, both um, all about fresh produce and using lots of lots of colour and lots of interesting foods. Um, actually, my first job actually was with my mum. She was working in a small cafe in Glenelg um, and I got a job there at eight, at eight years old just working um, just because I think basically she had you know, hadn't needed for me to go somewhere, so I ended up getting a job there as a little kitchen hand, um, washing dishes there at eight, um, which was my first exposure into a kitchen. I think. What was what was it like for you then? Was that a trigger for you to become a chef? Um, I think so. To be honest, I've always yeah, I've always had a really interest, um, you know, great interest in food. Um, grew up sort of um, you know, in that environment. I spent. Um, my teens working in the fast food industry and um, and that sort of, you know, even though that's not where I wanted to end up, it certainly um, gave me the insight into what, um, you know, the industry was about 
um, and I spent did my uh, did a lot of um, school work as far as um, catering at school and things like that. So I um, yeah spent a lot of spent a lot of my youth in kitchens and um, and working in industry. During your career in the early days, is there any um, places that are really integral in the development of you and food? Um, I guess I, I spent a lot of time in my apprenticeship at South Australia, in South Australia. I spent a lot of time working at um, Eagle on the Hill Hotel um, back in the day um, in the Adelaide Hills um, and worked with a chef there called Tim Whitehorn. Um, and he was actually one of Maggie Beer's first um, apprentices uh, way back in the day. Um, and he was really influencing a good influence on me as far as um, what it took to um, to lead a kitchen, what it took to um, produce good food. He was um, a, a great role model in using local products. I don't think it was you know back back then. We're talking sort of late nineties. The sort of nose to tail approach wasn't really a big thing then, and nor was not necessarily the local um, produce was either. So we, um, um, you know, he was big on that and engaging local farmers in the area and um, using local produce and local cheese makers that back when sort of Woodside Cheese first started was on the scene and things like that. And I remember using, you know, using stuff from him. Um, so yeah, he was a, yeah, he was a big influence on me. Tell us about your career as a chef prior to uh, the creation of Little Acre Foods. Uh, you said you ended up in, in Western Australia as well. Um what, what sort of chef um, were you and tell us a bit about your food? Um, I spent a lot of time traveling around Western Australia. So we moved sort of around a fair bit and then settled um, in Fremantle and worked mainly the cappuccino strip down there, a few cafes and things like that. Um, I then worked, did a bit of a stint at um, Clint Nolan's Place Harvest, which was a, a big steep learning curve for me um, there for a while. And after that, I actually... Um, uh, after sort of spending that much time in the industry, the you know the pull in Western Australia was to got offered to go work up north in some mining camps and run some catering companies up there. Um, and as much as it's not necessarily a um, the uh, um, uh, the culinary delight that I'd love to say I had, it was a great experience as far as what you can produce when you you know when you don't have all the um, you know, all the money to spend on food. Um, it was a, a great learning curve as far as running a massive team. You know, we were um, producing sort of 600 meals or oh, sorry, meals for 600 people a day with a really small budget. And I guess that you take that um, as a you know, as a chef, you, you know, people sort of questioned as to why, you know, why are you doing that? Why would you want to go and, um, you know, serve that sort of food in a Bay Marie sort of thing? And um, But it's it was an opportunity to obviously set myself up for the rest of our lives um, to go and earn a little bit more money than what was being offered in the industry. And, um, and I felt that if you brought the, um, the same ethics to, um, and passion for your food in, from a restaurant to a mining situation where these guys have, you know, they don't have anywhere else to eat. <laughs> they have to eat there for three days. Oh, sorry, for three meals a day and for 14 days in a row generally. So you can either be a very popular person on site or a, you know, not very popular person on site. And I think if you, it was an interesting avenue to sort of apply that, um, you know, the same method. And if you use, you know, fresh produce and you use herbs and salt and seasonings and spice and, and acid and things like that, you can actually create, um, you know, amazing food um, well, with what you're given uh, to use. And, and definitely, you know, those guys are, are pretty harsh critics and they'll they'll certainly let you know um, if they don't enjoy it. And, and then certainly we'll let you know if you, um, you do enjoy it. So it certainly set us up for, um, you know, being able to do what we do now. Cooking uh, interesting and healthy meals for 600 people a day is, is huge. Do you have any stories of that time and the sort of um, what it took to pull it together and what you were cooking? Um, a lot, yeah. I mean, you have, you're have relying on um, not very many staff. There's pretty pretty low, you know, low budget. Um, there's just the sheer amount of food you're producing and how well organised you have to be. And I guess doing, you know, trying to translate it to what we do now Um you know, it is very um, production, um, you know, production line sort of stuff up there, uh, making sure that you're, you know, well ahead of schedule um, for um, getting getting food out, um, and um, yeah, just the what sort of food did we cook? Lots of lots of wet dishes, lots of roast, lots of fish, um, lots of uh, um, you know, in, trying to trying to come up with interesting ways of turning, um, you know, you've. They're there for 14 days, so you've got to make sure they've got a you know, fairly different variety of food on offer for them um, to, during, during that period. 
Um, yeah, and it's amazing what um, you know, 600 people can eat the sheer amount of food that they can go through and um, and trying to do things properly. And I guess that's the um, yeah, we were we were cutting calamari to order rather than buying in um, you know frozen frozen calamari and things like that. And um, so trying to um, do the best we could. What did you enjoy about your time up in the mines? Um, the people and the flexibility of lifestyle. I think I really you needed it at that time. I was sort of a bit over the industry um, as far as um, working you know, late nights and weekends and missing and not getting many holidays. So I really enjoyed that time up there um, in in freedom and then lifestyle in being able to have a week off every every sort of fourteen days and um, and then getting a, you know you could take a holiday when you needed it. It wasn't a you weren't letting anyone down by. Um, getting out of the kitchen sort of thing, whereas, you know, a restaurant, it was always a hard thing to try and find a holiday. Um, whereas up there, you know, you'd just be able to have your, your week off and that was fine. You could leave your leave your work where it was and, and enjoy life, um, which I think is a big part of, you know, what we do now. You mentioned the steep learning curve at Harvest in WA. Take us back to that time. What, what, were, you, what were you learning and what was it like in that environment? Um, I think at the time I'd been running a little, prior to that, I'd been running a little, um, yeah, a little restaurant cafe in the sort of other end of Fremantle and sort of, um, as a head chef there and, um, stepping into a, a much higher, um, quality restaurant. I realized where I was at, um, as a chef and what I needed to learn, um, and what it was going to take to, to get those skills. Um, and just seeing, and I think I, you know, was approaching, some of the other restaurants I was working in, in a sort of what I wanted to, it was all about what I wanted to cook. Um, at the time I was probably a bit young and a bit arrogant, um, and not being, not looking at it in a sense of what was actually best for that restaurant. And I think moving to some of the other restaurants, um, especially that one and that harvest was, you know, doing what was right for there and, and, um, learning, um, yeah, that that finer finer details and some of the stuff that we do now, I sort of picked up there. I think that was the first place I ever made a um, a react as well. Um, um, and you, yeah, learn, learning some new techniques and things like that there as well. Um, just having a, a really strong influence of some chefs that had worked in some really quality restaurants, which I hadn't sort of had that influence before. Take us back to that time, and you stumbled upon the opportunity to um, start. Uh, the the business and with Wollonga Farmers Markets as well. Um, what was it like creating the products? Were you, did you know how to make them all at first? Um, yeah, so the um, not all of them, to be honest. We um, the passe, our chicken liver passe that we do was our sort of first product that we made. Um, that was a sort of staple on our on all my menus um, throughout my cooking career, and I kind of felt that that was the one that was going to be an easy, you know, good starting point. It had always been a um, a crowd pleaser. Um, and felt that that was an opportunity to start there. Um, and then needed to felt that we needed another addition to that. We couldn't just go to market with us with a with a chicken liver passe. We're going to need something a little bit more than that. So we started off with riettes as well. So when we we hit the market with yeah, just a chicken liver passe at the time, uh, a pork riette and a duck riette at the time, um, and yeah, got them into the on the menu at Cantina Social and. Um, and then from there, we've sort of developed obviously those skills, and um, over the time, have added more more passes and more terrines and stuff, and and added now um, a you know a, ra- a range of small goods that we sort of sell at the farmers market mainly, uh, which is I guess comes from our um, a lot of our waste product, um, not waste. I don't like calling it waste. Um, it's our it's our product that we. Um, you know, use, we use whole pig and whole animals. Um, so needing to create other things so that we could, um, continue to use that supply of pork. Um, we, we needed to come up with other avenues. So fresh sausages and chorizos and, um, things like that and bacon that we've been able to, um, learn and produce now and have a quite a good following at the Wollonga farmers market for that. Um, which has allowed us to continue to buy, our, um, our, our whole pigs. What does it take to make a great pork riette? Uh, time, salt, fat, <laughs> um, and and a really good product in the beginning. There's no point um, starting off with something that's not not um, good quality. Um, we use a we use Beachport Berkshire, um, so a really nice free range um, Berkshire pork grown in Beachport in South Australia, um, and we'll use um, we'll use some jowl. Uh, some belly, some shoulder, and some shoulder in that. 
um, salt that down for sort of 24 to 48 hours um, with some other herbs and spices, some mace and nutmeg, things like that. And then, um, and the leaf lard, will uh, get that in there as well. Um, and then uh, that'll comfy in its fat and some, and some, some of our uh, black fat as well goes in there. Um, and then pull sort of cooked overnight long and slow and, um, and then pulled the next day and, and mixed back with some of the glee, which is the liquid that comes out of the comfy meat, um, mixed back with some of the fat and, and pot it up and, and ready to go. You mentioned the importance of quality product to start with. Tell us about your connection with um, pork producers and, and beach pork and why that's so important to what you do. Um, yeah, we've had a, um, a really good connection with all our suppliers, um, not just, not, not just pork, but pork's the, um, we use the, quite a lot of that, obviously. Um, we, the, the relationship we've got with Beachport Berkshire at the moment is fantastic. We, um, we've been sort of engaging with them over the last probably four to five years, to be honest. Um, and these relationships don't, um, you know, sort of, um, start off, um, you, you know, you need these relationships to develop over time. Um, we've probably only been using the pork consistently now for two years. Um, when we first engaged, um, engaged them, they weren't able to, they weren't supplying to Adelaide at the time, and I don't, or we weren't big enough to be able to take X amount of pig that it was going to be needed for them to be viable. Um, but so now we've, um, now that sort of over time, it's sort of we've got bigger, they've got bigger, they've got more avenues. Um, we've sort of engaged other um, places in our general area to help sort of try and take some some pork for them, which makes it. Um, you know, a bit more viable for them to to drive this way for the abattoir, um, and um, and now we've been yeah using their product for a couple of years. It's a beautiful free range Berkshire pork grown on pasture, and they're an APIQ certified free range supplier. Um, uh, and yeah, just having that connection with them, trust growing together, um, and um, and knowing what we're getting every week is uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And I just love that, that we've been able to stay in that relationship. Um, you know, it's not like something you can just ring up and get it that week and start. And that's something we've learned starting the business. We um, you know, really wanted to be able to use really um, ethically sourced product and get it locally. And, and, you know, but you can't just start that on day one. You can't, you can't just ring up someone and get their product instantly. It's a it's a long term you know building relationship. They want to know you know how you're going to use it, what are you going to use it for, how much you're going to use, um, and those things take time. And um, and you know that building of relationship. A great terrain is an incredible uh, afternoon snack or start to a meal. You've got a pork and walnut and verjuice uh, terrain. And tell us about the process to create. A, a great terrain. Um, again, I guess you're starting off with a really great product, um, and then we we bone all our own pigs, so we'll get in whole pigs, um, and then we will bone bone the shoulder. Um, we use mainly mainly forequarter and shoulder in that. Um, we'll also in that use a little bit of jowl and um, and some belly trim. So we'll and this is how we obviously use our use up our whole pigs and making sure that we separate them as to how we need them and bone them out the way we need them. Um, we'll trim our bacon a little bit shorter than a normal rash of bacon and use a bit of that belly, um, which we find really helps soften the terrain a little bit, adds a little extra fat through it. Um, and then obviously really good quality back fat off our pigs as well um, go in there. So we'll bone all that out. Um, we'll let that sit overnight in some um, pepper and brandy and um, wine and things like that and some spices um, and mince the next day um, and then added all our garnishes and herbs and walnuts for that one or duck and fig for our other pork duck duck and fig terrain um and we'll add all that um and one of the main processes in in getting that right is our um throwing once we've once we've sort of minced it and mixed it with our um, egg whites and things like that as a binder we um we throw the terrain into the molds and that's the technique i guess is used to try and eliminate any air pockets um into the terrain and then wrapped um wrapped in um back uh, sorry wrapped in cool fat um, and then baked and baked in the oven, and so there's a long, you know, they're a long process. They're um, sort of a three day, I guess. By the time you've probably three to four days, by the time they're actually sliced and packed and um, cooked in a water bath in the oven till they're sort of at the right temperature, and um, they're also one of the ones that are, you know, one of the really high risk food um, products that we make, and and a lot of testing around greens and listeria and things like that. So um, they are a really careful product and. and a, one that takes a lot of time and care to, to get out to market. What is it about a pig that makes it so versatile for what you do? Um, well, there's nothing, there's no really waste on a pig, and I think that's what makes it good for us, but also good for um, 
the farmers as well. There's a lot. There's a lot we can do with pig, and there's nothing that really goes to waste. And we're getting much better at at, at that as well, and and developing more products on our farmers market list that we can try and make sure that we you know absolutely minimise all the waste we've got. Um, uh, what makes it really good for what we do? Um, the age. Um, so we're trying to get them a little bit older than and a little bit bigger than what is a retail pig. We sort of try to get them into that sort of eighty to ninety kilo range where they've um, worked pretty hard, had a bit of a life um, foraging around the paddocks, and they're growing on grass. Um, so they've had good feed. Um, we're obviously looking for really good quality fat content. Um, that sort of greasy. Greasy fat that sort of when you hold it in your hands, you can you can feel the the grease coming out of it. Um, and they're just yeah, really. But you know, we can we make I probably lost count how many products we make out of them now. But if you look at what a whole pig comes into and what you can end up with, um, it's amazing. And I think people, um, you know, a lot of people try and do a pig day themselves with family and things like that. And it's amazing what people say after. <laughs> Um, you know, friends always say, "Oh, we should do a pig day, and we could make this and make this." And it's like, "There's a lot. It's a lot of work. There's a lot. You know, there's a lot involved in it. It's not just a matter of you know, it's not a fun day drinking beers and and making sausages. There's there's a lot more. Um, you know, you end up with a lot of product at the end, and um, and very yeah, and and a, a wide range of products. Unfortunately, we don't do any of the um, um, you know, hard cured sort of products and the fermented stuff. That's not our game. Um, although we'd love to learn more about it. Um, it's you know, once you've, you know, it's, I guess pigs have been great because you can, you can eat, you can make something to eat today, but you can also make something that's, um, you know, good in six weeks or or eighteen months if you're talking prosciutto and things like that. So, uh, being able to preserve the product and then um, eat it later on is fantastic. You mentioned uh, the small goods that you are getting into. Um, bacon is much loved everywhere, but there's a ama- amazing bacon that really. Um, sets an example for for it what do you have any stories of the success of when you landed on a great bacon um i think just knowing um how when you feed it to your family and friends and 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 the customers we get at the farmer's market and the comments we get back um they're the stories that we love to hear how much people um just keep coming back for it and just say that's you know the difference between and um the difference between what is available commercially and what is, you know, there's some great people doing artisan bacon all over the country and, and just trying to educate people um, as to what that, you know, what that is. And um, I guess that's our um, sort of love affair with the farmer's market is that connection to our customer, um, getting that direct feedback straight away. And, you know, if we've, we've had fails there where we've made them too salty or too sweet and or this, that and the other, and you sort of, um, you know, you sort of trying to learn from that and pull things here and, um, and listen to people, um, but also just the, the amazing feedback you get from people trying to explain them how to cook it and what to expect um, um, and what to do with, uh, you know, what to, what, what other things they can do with the bacon as well. Um, you know, we try and tell people to, um, you know, use the ends we've got, use, usually ends that we can use up and stuff that they can use in Guanchart, you know, sorry, uses um, for carbonara and pasta and things like that and soups and, uh, and what flavour they're going to get. We often tell people, you know, you're going to get, instead of getting a whole bunch of liquid coming out of our bacon because we don't pump ours, we dry cure ours, um, you'll end up with some rendered fat in the pan. Save that fat and throw it through some, you know, your next lot of roast potatoes. Don't don't waste that fat. Don't, you know, we've, we've paid for that fat and so have you. So um, if you're not going to, if you don't like it, just don't, don't throw it away. Just use it for something else. And um, I think that's sort of, um, yeah, my, our job as producers and um, off, you know, um, at the farmers market is to help educate people. How important are the farmers markets for what you do? Uh, really important, Huck. They yeah, they make up probably about twelve percent of our income these days. Um, you know, overall for the year, which is was quite a lot. Um, but just seeing that we get we probably get about sixty five percent of return customers are you know, our regular customers every week, if not more. Um, and it's it's our opportunity to. Explain to people what we do. It's um, explain to people why food costs what it costs, um, and trying to get that through to people. Um, and our connection with other farmers, other producers. We've learned so much from some of our um, other producers in the area um, and, and storeholders and and things like that. We were we were lucky enough when we first started the Wollonga Farmers Market that we were paired up next to good friends of ours now, Chris and Emily from Small World Bakery, who um, a lot of people will know. Um, and, you know, they were a great influence on us or on me. Um, it's just, just the way that they go about their business and what they produce. Um, 
and how they and how they produce it and the lengths they'll go to to get full flavor out of their product to the point that now they're sort of growing you know they'll grow their, they grow their own grain now and mill their own flour um, to make their bread yeah it's pretty it's very impressive and i think that's sort of i've sort of taken that um you know i know when they first started doing that um they were sort of talking about the inconsistencies in in some of the the wheat and um, and how diff, you know how that was difficult, but um, you know it was the education on uh, how um, you know that flavour was the most important part. It didn't really matter to them whether the bread looked perfect anymore and whether it rose perfectly. It was all about the flavour, and I think we've sort of taken that approach with. And I don't want to suggest that we're not looking for inconsistent, you know, not looking for consistency in our product. Um, but I think if we want to use um, you know, free range ethically sourced products. We also need to evolve to um, be adaptable to those nuances that are in the product um, as well. I think sometimes we're sterilizing our, our consumer base that everything has to be identical um, and, and supplementing flavor for that. You moved back to South Australia, Australia at a really important time in uh, your life and also made a change as well. What sort of uh, impact has that change and the creation of uh, little acre foods had on you um it's certainly uh, given me a, a much more much more of the lifestyle i was looking for we um one of the things i really wanted to do was um uh have a different i didn't i didn't want to be a chef and working in industry in restaurant industry when i had kids um i think that's something i i sort of decided on pretty early after working as a apprentice chef um, and watching lots of lots of chefs go through some difficult times um, in that space um, and has sort of made that decision that that's, I wanted to do something before we had kids. Um, so it's definitely given me a, um, a much better lifestyle that I was looking for and being able to spend a lot more time at home and, and with the kids and, and weekends and things like that. Um, it's also just given me a great appreciation for where we live and the people in our community. We um, were able to um, build our business here with the help of lots of other people um, and and just that sense of community it's really it's given me given me that what do you love about what you do now um, what I love about what we do now um this I love the fact that we're we're still here we're still we're still um, producing we're getting bigger every year but we've got bigger gradually our growth's been been fantastic for us it's been perfectly us it's been probably about thirty percent um, every year since we started, but it's been um, in line with our producers. It's been in line with our staff, in line with our with my capabilities. Um, I think that's one of the things we've been able to do is our product's pretty well respected out there, and um, it's a uh, you know the quality is still there that it was on day one. Um, our packaging's definitely changed a little bit over time, um, but our our product's still very much the same product it was was then, and we haven't dropped in quality so. Being able to continue that um, has been fantastic. You've uh, built an incredible business and you're still a, a family business. How do you see the next couple of years uh, as we move forward? Um, yeah, I see it well. I'm hoping that we've we've sort of just taken on a new a new butcher in our um, in our company at the moment, um, which will help me out a lot. Um, that'll allow us to develop a bit more of our um, wholesale. Um, small goods market, I think that's something we'll try and adapt into next year. Um, at the moment, it's just been a farmer's market um, avenue for sales there, but I think we'll try and um, uh, develop a bit more in that space. Um, and I'm hoping that we're getting to the point where, you know, our staff have been so fantastic to us over time and, and held in there with us in sort of casual job positions. And I think now, um, you know, we're getting to the point now where a lot of those I'd love to see, you know, I'd really love to see them in the next you know, 12, 12 months or two years all have full-time jobs and just that security for them would be fantastic to be able to pay back that trust that they've put in us over time and hung in there um, on a sort of difficult uh, difficult journey. And, and But now that's sort of, you know, they should be able to hopefully be able to show them that in the, in the near future. Well, Jim, congratulations on what you've built and look forward to seeing what you do from here on. We've loved having you on The Crackling today to hear a bit of your story. Please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks very much, Huck. Cheers. Thanks for the chat. This is The Crackling, a Deep in the Weeds production in partnership with Porkstar. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we catch up with some of Australia's best chefs and pork producers 
to discover what makes Australian pork so special.